Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 108, I'm going to say. Good morning, my name is Agostino, hope you guys are doing well. I'm learning German, as that intro proved, and I'm going to be fluent by the time I get to Berlin next week, obviously. But yeah, what's up man, what's going on, hope you guys are well, hope you guys are well rested, well hydrated and are well looked after, hope you've received a hug in the last 14 days and if you haven't, might then you open the window that's next to you and jump out of it. But apart from that, hope you guys are doing very well, I'm very good, um, I've finally got a bit of a, a, bit of a break this these next couple of weeks which is um, very well deserved, I think well earned on my, rep- on my part because unfortunately, or fortunately or unfortunately, you know, sometimes working shift work is great because you get the opportunity to have a day off during a week which allows you to do like monday and weekly stuff that you don't get a chance to do like go get a haircut like i can go get a haircut like early in the day i can leave my house go get a trim um i can go and do food shopping when no one's around and kind of get my weekly shop out of the way it helps in that regard but then sometimes it doesn't help because what ends up happening is that you have a pattern where you start working a lot of weekends and because i've been doing a lot of saturdays yeah i've been doing mostly a lot of saturdays usually um but then i've been in on a friday and then obviously on fridays i usually dj at tappy so i have to dj day after work which is good which is okay because i finish work at 5 p.m so i have a chance to like if i'm if i'm quick and i'm and i'm on it i have a chance to quickly come back home wash shower and then head off to tappy's to go dj there is an argument to be had that i should take my dj stuff with me but i don't want to carry all my shit have everyone ask oh what's in your bag what's in your there oh you dj da, da, da. i don't like that song and dance it's already annoying when you're working in the office and you order stuff from amazon or or asos or whatever you order your stuff from and it comes in and everyone's fucking googling your shit um it's not a bad thing don't get me wrong i understand it because for the most part everyone's just bored right they just want to any distraction that they see they want to make a comment a uh, workplace is a lot like a classroom and have you realized that if you work in a workplace right even if it's in a shop it's a lot like a classroom like um any bit of noise if someone falls over someone trips no one just like carries on their day and just ignores it or just like ah, not a big deal someone will laugh someone will make a comment someone will alert you that you should have seen that thing that just happened right there so if you work somewhere, the, 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 the normal kind of procedure you have to go through is people asking about your holiday, people asking about what you're eating for lunch, people asking where you're going to go for lunch, people asking if you got any ideas where they should go for lunch, um, what did you order, what's inside that order, where did you get it from, blah, 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 blah. So I've never been that kind of guy to kind of do that thing. You know some people do, where they're normal people, where they, if they're going to go on a trip to Europe or somewhere, usually European trips, right, they'll kind of, um, they'll usually book a flight after work, right? They'll just kind of like... Um, They'll look at their rota, see if they've worked um, overtime some da- sometimes and then claim back the hours. So instead of getting extra money, just like um, maybe work, uh, I don't know, three hours less and then f- and then kind of take their luggage with them and then fly out. I don't want none of that drama. I don't want anyone asking me why I've got my carry-on luggage with me at work and then wondering where I'm going and have to give them the whole song and dance. I hate that shit. So because of that, I have to kind of suffer in silence and run back home, which isn't too bad because my work, my home is only like 20 minutes away from where I work or like half an hour door to door and now quickly change and go. But because I work shift work and I'm doing the Saturdays all the time, I'm DJing from, five to, um, from 7 to 11, I'm drinking, um sometimes or most of the time that i'm there i'm standing up i'm, I'm working i mean i'm active even though i'm drinking having a good time it still requires some form it's you're still engaging your brain i'm not just mindlessly sitting there and go through a playlist of songs i'm kind of taking requests i'm kind of changing the mood i'm seeing if people are not really feeling this vibe and going that direction so i'm kind of working myself a little bit i'm getting a bit tired mentally and physically so then by the time i come back home after i finished and had maybe a couple of more drinks with the guys that in the bar um which there might be a common theme here, right? Maybe the drink is what's making me tired. I don't think so. I don't think so. Don't get me wrong. I don't think so. But maybe that might add, add to it. I have tried to DJ sober. And I can tell you um, one thing. It's not fun, right? Um, don't let anyone kid you. It's not fun. And if you notice, right, any interview you might have heard of somebody that DJs and they're sober, like a Sven Var, for instance, right? Um, he's a very uh, popular and very influential um kind of like founding father of the berlin techno scene right um he is now completely sober right doesn't do anything and if you see some of his sets online because he recalls quite a lot of his dj sets he was probably one of the big he was probably one of the first of the kind of old guard of the kind of like you know the cold the whole kind of like pete tong generation the kind of you know the the oldies the guys are like 50 40 and plus right he's probably one of the first that generation who kind of embraced digital media or, or embraced social media for instance um and kind of content generation he was he didn't mind recording his sets because i know a lot of the older guys 
don't like recording their sets because they come from the school of play where they don't like to publish their playlist of what they play in the mix because they don't want anyone to find their tracks and they kind of go back to the whole idea of like you know you should be digging and even if you are a fan which is which is quite um special about electronic music isn't it i think so in that regard i think for the most part there there doesn't really seem to be hype people that are involved in electronic music hype fans it doesn't really exist like even if you like all those hard world guys right um and r.i.p of and all that kind of scene and you go to tomorrowland you know your shit you know that music you know it back and front like you've got those guys you know their releases you know what comes out you know who produced this you know who sung on that um for the most part even those guys even the kind of essex people that like um tech house and deep house they know their tunes like they know who to they know what dj's playing they know who produced it they know what club to go to like they're very in tune of it like i think electronic music has that for the most part there's no real bandwagoning it doesn't really exist i don't think so maybe with the whole steve aoki guys i think so but i don't think so either i think those girls that get cake thrown at their face i think they could name producer credits of a couple of tracks from steve aoki i'm pretty sure they could so a lot of those old DJs don't like to publish playlists because they come from that school that says that, you know, if you're a fan, you should dig and find out what I played. I don't mind playing it. Like, they're not playing stuff and, like, kind of, you know, giving you fucking earplugs so you can't hear what they play. Imagine that. Imagine those DJs out there, right, that was so anal or that was so protective about the music they played that they handed out earplugs. Uh, <laughs> so you couldn't listen to a certain thing. You just had to kind of, like, you just kind of had to, like, not pretend, but... You know, um, imagine what it's, it must sound like. It's it's in your head. You're going. It's, 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 it's. Imagine if that happened, right? <laughs> you had to pretend that you're hearing something. That would be fucking nuts. So a lot of those old guys don't like doing it, but Sven Var did it. But going back to the whole like sobriety thing, Sven Var is probably one of the biggest DJs that is kind of I don't know. He's kind of out there and says that he is sober, but he, there's vid there's videos you can find of him on YouTube um, from Love Parade, um, the one of the biggest kind of like global gatherings or um, outdoor gatherings of people. So celebrating techno music happened like during the 80s and kind of it kind of died out towards the 90s but at its peak love parade it's kind of imagine like imagine not in all carnival but for techno music right just all on the streets like with floats everything like insane not in all carnival with techno music minus the guns minus the guns and knives right and all the acid right just like loads of pills and fucking uh cyber of golf, golf girls and loads of guys with a top off who will happen to, will happen to have a six-pack whenever you see those videos of love parade or berlin techno festivals why is it everyone got a six-pack is it because the videographer is only picking up people's six-pack or is it because everyone that goes to techno parties know they're going to get a top off so they just make sure they don't eat any carbs? Do you know what I mean? And do mad sit-ups before they go to bed. Like, I, just, I just can't imagine anyone in Berlin or anyone that's like a fuckhead that goes out and takes drugs that, that often that can do that many sit-ups. Or maybe if you're on that much coke, right, you could probably bang out 100 sit-ups like in a minute, maybe. I don't know. I have, I've never tried. Um, both things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so Sven Vaz is sober at the moment, but his sobriety came because he experienced everything. Like, he, he reached the zenith. He reached the top of the mountain, right? And then realized that if he wants to sustain a long career, plus I'm sure he has a family, he has a wife, or he has businesses, he has responsibilities, he has to pay people's wages. You can't... I don't think you can... I don't think even a, even if you've got a real good team around you, I don't think they can facilitate you being a caner um in your old age i just think it's some way in some um in some way shape or form it's going to take its toll on you and you're going to feel it like and people are going to see the effects of it and you're going to you're going to lose people people are going to be out of jobs you're going to lose opportunities sponsors are going to drop you blah, blah 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 things will happen like you you only have to look at the scandal that happened with g easy recently right um a couple of I think a few months ago he was the video a kind of picture went around of him like sniffing coke of some models bum or tits or something along those kind of lines then he has this relationship with Halsey who's a really big like you know kind of like um pop star at the moment they have this really kind of like you know big grandiose um public kind of romance that is kind of really rock and roll really bonnie and clyde style they kind of obviously have like this you know it just seems like a kind of really high energy relationship so there might be some arguments there might be some really passionate love making you know that kind of like duality you know the kind of person that's you know you know those kind of people that you see arguing on the streets in a couple like you can kind of spot them like they're arguing like they're gonna come they're gonna come close to blows but then two minutes later when you turn back again they're fucking uh, licking each other's face do you know what i mean some people just have that kind of love and then recently he went to i think to sweden or somewhere along those kind of lines and got into a fight with a promoter or something like that and then um i think they found coke on him or whatever da, 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 da. so you can you can see that sometimes um partaking in that much class a drugs or do or overindulging in, in drugs and alcohol especially if you're a big pop star in the public somewhere shape or form it's going to bleed out right because you know i'm a civilian 
and I've, if, 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 I, if I get too fucked up and I make a mistake, right, or I don't know, I take a shit somewhere, I take a shit in a fucking hallway, I'll get too fucked up or get too drunk at a work party, I can expect to get fired, right? So imagine what must happen if you're a pop star and you have, you know, you have a green room full of uh, amazing croissants that they've been pouring for Paris and fucking wine and spirits and shit and liquor. I mean, it can only go one way. So Senva kind of had to reach that point and then he decided to kind of rein it back in. I think now at the moment, um, you know, working full time, because I think if I wasn't working full time, I think it'd be hard, easier to do the sobriety thing DJing. I think so. I think if I just had like, you know, if I was just like, you know, a creative that was able to like make money um, making YouTube videos and doing podcasts and writing on blogs and shit or all that, whatever influencer people do, right? If I was able to just live on the, live off the internet and sustain a career that way, I think I'd be able to be sober. I think so. It'd be a lot more easy to do it. But I think the fact that you've got a nine to five, right? And the fact that you're doing something that you don't necessarily, even, I, I, even if I think, again, I haven't been in a position, I haven't been fortunate enough to have a job where I was like, I'm going to do this the rest of my life, right? So, which is why I'm kind of doing this sort of thing, right? I kind of want to create my own little lane. I kind of want to make sure I'm paying the rent, but also want to make my own lane and do something that I can that do. Basically, I want to be responsible for putting food on my own plate, right? Um, all the way through, not just receiving the money, but making it. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, just kind of be resourceful in my own regard and kind of have my destiny in my own hands. Not entrepreneurship, not like building a new Facebook or whatever, just something really simple, whether it's a bar, whether it's a service, whether it's a brand, just something that I can kind of control. So I think sometimes if you have that, Right, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think the urge or the kind of inkling to escape from the weekend comes around. I don't think so, really, because I think you when you do something that you love and you enjoy, you um, a lot of people say that have their own businesses. They always say you end up working more than you'd work in a nine to five, right? You don't work nine to five; you work nine to nine, right? Because you just love what you do. Um, so I don't think there's a need to go out and get fucked up to, to forget the woes of your workplace or forget the woes of a relationship because I think it all kind of adds. Like I think you also be, you'll probably be a better person to hang, hang around with, right? If you're a girl and you like to talk about cupcakes and you had, you had a YouTube channel or a blog where you just spoke about cupcakes the whole time, right? You'll be quite a cool girl to hang around with. Like you'll be, you know what I mean? You'll be quite nice. Like you'll be quite bubbly. You've, you've, you've always got quite a, like a half glass full outlook on life. You're not really cynical. Do you know what I mean? You've got like a positive... Uh, dispossession overall right um, but I think if you're working a 9 to 5 and you're grinding and you've only got 3 subscribers on YouTube and you're trying to do this, this cupcake blog and you're working in a, in a job that you don't like and they don't give you any autonomy you don't feel like you've got any ownership uh, people don't listen to your ideas it won't yeah i mean there is a there is a possibility that that will drive you to kind of like to just to a point of wanting a distraction which might come in the form of relationships and boys and drama at work drama with friends or drinking or drug whatever that will happen more often so i think if i was able to be quote unquote freelance or have my own thing that i was doing not even freelance because that is still kind of like you're working for somebody but just working for myself like being able to do my own thing right I think I probably would be sober and it would be a lot more easier. But when you're not sober and you're working a nine to five and you're working on a Saturday, it can take it out of you. And even someone like me who kind of has this, I have a, I have a bit of a false, I have a, no, I have a bit of a narrative I tell myself in my head, right? That, oh yeah, I can do it. I'm fine. I'm strong. Um, not physically, but like, you know, I'm mentally robust. I can put up with things. I don't mind. You know what I mean? I've always kind of like, you know, I'm always trying to brush it off. But I think even for me in the last few months, it has kind of like started to take its toll. Um, I have started to kind of feel a bit run down. I have started to kind of feel a little bit, um, how to say, not miffed, but you know, just like fucking no, this is a lot. You know what I mean, and then I and then I started to realize. I think that's why I was ranting and raving about Mark Wahlberg's uh, routine the other day because I've started to really appreciate people who are a the A listers, like the A players. I'm really, really appreciative of. Uh, Mark Wahlberg, right? Of um, of a James Franco, of a Keanu Reeves, right? Of a Reese Witherspoon, um, Angelina Jolie, right? All these people, I'm really appreciative of them because I know, like, from my small fucking, from my fucking low, low vantage point, right? I'm fucking low, low, low on the ladder, but I know just from doing what I'm doing, right? I I, I can appreciate how hard it must be to be a uh, to be a fucking BBC Radio 1 extra uh, presenter every morning, right? And do that show consistently, like a Nick Grimshaw, for instance, right? And then go on, uh, then go on 8 out of 10 Cats panel show and then kind of, yeah, you know I mean, and do that whole comedian value and then go become like a, I don't know, a celebrity presenter for Celebrity Big Brother or whatever. I don't know all that stuff, right? I can appreciate it now more because I know how much work that must take to kind of consistently stay there. And you have to imagine if you're a Nick Grimshaw, there's always somebody underneath you who's kind of sniping at your heels wanting to take your position. So it's not only you have to maintain 
maintain your own level, you also have to make sure that no one is taking your position, which is fucking insane to think about. Like, imagine thinking about that. Like, you have to make sure that you're good, but you have to also make sure that no one else can take your spot. It's like, fucking hell, man. It must be insane. So I think, again, like I said, I think the balancing that will come soon. I think now... Um, it's about trying to make sure that I'm working somewhere that's on Monday to Friday that will probably help me break it up a little bit better. And if, I, if I'm if i fortunate enough to get booked for a gig somewhere in Europe or go to a festival, I could do that thing that a lot of people do that I've read in interviews where they kind of just take holiday on a Friday or on a Monday and they just kind of fly out, do the gig and then kind of come back, right? It's a, it's a bit of an anticlimax, you know, DJing in front of a sold out crowd or DJing in front of a big crowd somewhere in the middle of hungry and then coming back to work at your nine to five desk job. But I think that'll be a better way if physically for you to handle it instead of me, you know, working shift work, working on Saturday. But I have to stay, I have to say, right, still working shift work, having days off from the week is still handy. Like I get, I get why some countries have that kind of three day weekend thing because or three day week or four day week. I think they have it in Sweden. I think I saw an article recently. I think it's a plant or car manufacturers, I think here or somewhere else. But I think a lot of places, some Scandinavian countries do allow their workers to sometimes work four days a week or they do that thing where they you can start um, you can end earlier so they end at like half four whenever it is so it's most of the, most of the or i think it's free whatever time that before kids um finish primary school so that some of the kids or some of the um sorry employees can go pick up their children after work which is amazing right it means that you can take your kids to work in the morning and you can go pick them up right that must be incredible and that must again it's that kind of you know they have a probably a different perspective on the whole like family unity and how the family works and if you ensure that a parent is able to be present in that kid's life then it's more unlikely that kid's going to grow up and become a delinquent you know those kind of things that you can things that you can control why not control them in that regard so i get it and again like if you finish that half free you can pop over to the bank and i don't know whatever you need to do get a replacement card or you know you can go and get a haircut or just i don't know weird things like that weird things that you know because you, you you must have felt if you've been to a tesco or wherever near a big station after work it's like everyone's thinking of the same thing everyone's trying to like squeeze in as much squeeze as much time as they can at the time available and do stuff like you know and no one wants to do their weekly shopping in a tesco express because you end up spending much more money than you would do if you go to a big supermarket so uh people do that all the time so um again it's been it's been an interesting journey overall i'm really really enjoying it i think again i think if anything this has really made this has really humbled me and made me realize that even all those other years that i thought i was killing and i thought i was doing shit i wasn't doing anything i think i've only just started doing things or feeling like i'm making progress or feeling like i'm actually um doing um you know when people say working hard is not enough you have to kind of what's it work um what's that thing called specifically i don't know there's a term for it but i think i'm now doing things the right way and i can feel it because i because it's really hard right that that's a kind of another weird thing like it feels really hard to do like the german thing i feel silly walking around the park at lunchtime reciting german words right and I feel a bit embarrassed by it. But I know that that's a way that you can kind of get familiar with the language. I'm not going to be fluent in it. I'm not going to be um, which you got, giving a TED talk when I go to Berlin. But I'm going to be familiar with the language. So when I'm standing in the train station, it doesn't sound like gibber gibberish, right? Do you know what I mean? So same with this kind of whole you know, journey. I can feel that it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of time. But I'm, I'm doing the right things. I just got to do more of it consistently though that's the thing as well on top of it i was like oh my god this isn't enough i've got to do it again and again consistently consistently build 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 and eventually you know we'll see where it leads but yeah apart from that everything else has been fine i didn't go work out today actually i, I kind of chilled uh, i'm doing three days a week in it so i'm gonna work i'm gonna go run for a run tomorrow I had a four mile run yesterday which was felt good felt really fresh the days in between really help um the weather's kind of cooling down now so i might go head back into the gym now as well maybe when i come back from berlin i might start doing that so that'll be good. So it will be a lot cooler in there. It won't be as um, clammy. So that'll be nice. Um, but I'm still going to make sure I keep on the top of the running. Even though the, the gym's not a big deal because it's only 26 quid a month. So even if I am only going there twice a week, um, I, st I still feel like I get my money's worth because, you know, for, for a local borough gym, it's pretty good, to be honest. Um, most of the free weights are pretty good. Uh, they've got loads of kettlebells. There's loads of room to do kind of my, my kind of quote, CrossFit workouts and stuff. So I'm more than happy to do that. But the running has been amazing, man. It's been great to go get back into running again. Um, I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. It's another resurgence. I always kind of have these kind of cycles anyway in general. Um, I think when I was at my heaviest, I think it was more, I was more um, driven to do it because I just wanted to fit into skinnier clothes. Now I'm in that kind of in-between weight, you know, you're kind of like skinny fat, right? So I can, st I still look good in clothes, but I don't look good naked yet. So I think that's, but that's probably why I'm not bothered about r running too much, but I'm, I'm liking getting back into it overall. And again, the weight's coming off. I feel fresh. I, don't, I feel strong. Um, I'm getting quicker. I'm getting stronger. So yeah, hopefully may it long continue. 
Anyway, um, let's jump into these topics because I've been rambling on and on about my day and most important things are the topics. So, uh, topic number one, Kanye moving back to Chicago. So, um, again, I, I, I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of gossip. I'm not like talking about gossipy, gossipy shit. Um, it's just not my vibe. I guess um, ha- grow. I guess maybe is that, would you say growing up in a conservative household did that to me? I don't know if it's growing up in convers- conservative house because again, you know, reading you're, you're about Noah Harari's books, right? Um, he's a dude that writes *Sapiens* and *Homo Deus*, and he's got a new book out at the moment, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century." He argues that there's no such thing as free will. Free will, right? You don't make you don't make your own choices. Somehow or the other, another, they're you know they're kind of dictated to you, or without you realizing by your surroundings, by your biology, by society overall, right? There there is no such thing as free will, which is why um, most startups are kind of you know um, pushing towards the um, pushing towards the direction of algorithms and. Um, sort of like algorithm based feeds right instagram isn't budging for instance like everyone's kind of get everyone complains about instagram not having a chronological feed right so you can't go on there and i can't if you uploaded a picture yesterday i want i I, maybe if someone engaged with it a lot or you're my friend it'll come to the top but it's not in order right the feed that you if you log into most of your social media accounts you wouldn't realize it's not in order it's not chronological i think some platforms do like i'm not sure who does it but it's not a feature that's like in your face you have to kind of go into your settings and change it but a lot of people want to have a chronological news feed right so they can actually find out things when they want to find out things and not get told things when the algorithm wants to tell them things right so he argues another uh, no you you vow no harari argues that it's not such thing as free will so sometimes when i think about the fact that sometimes you know i have my little character um traits that i have i've i wonder whether it's to do with the way i was brought up which i don't think so because my mom is quite gossipy right i grew up in a household i know most people that grew up in immigrant households are always used to hearing their parents screaming on the phone like ah, la, la. they're used to having phone calls i mean i'm used to fucking running out at nine in at nine at night at 12 at 12 years old or even younger than that right having to go to off license and buy a scratch card for my i mean sorry a calling card for my mum. And then being in the shop with a fucking with the seventeen drunk guys trying to buy crowns of Cronenberg, right? So that that was my experience. So everyone's used to. I think immigrant families you're used to hearing your parents scream on the phone. You're used to calling cards and all that sort of malarkey. So you're used to kind of hearing people talking about other people in general, right? There's always think something going on in the family. Or oh, did you hear about Uncle this? Or did you hear about Auntie that? Did you hear about their son this? Da, da, da. There's always something, right? Or oh, their daughter got pregnant and she's only sixteen. Like there's always some gossip going on for the most part. My mom's a super super chatty patty. Like she's all up in people's business and even more so even worse so right because um now or uh, even even worse so now in this era which is fucking weird right my winter mom's house the other day and um there's now a thing in the african culture i'm sure every culture has it but there's now a thing especially in the, in the yangolan sort of congolese culture where there's a there's loads of youtube accounts where they sort of like it's sort of like a african version of dj academics but it's not with somebody sitting in front of a camera like me talking to you or sitting in front of a microphone it's sort of like uh video clips of this drama actually happening and someone sort of narrating over it kind of like news but like all on gossip it's a fucking weird phenomenon i wish some some european or western europe or kind of you know uh, english speaking uh, country would kind of like um look at it and kind of highlight it maybe advice will do something along the lines because it's quite an interesting phenomenon and i think it probably wouldn't work here because people wouldn't want you to be filming them as they're arguing, having an argument with their sister or some shit, right? That probably wouldn't work, but it kind of works in that same sort of vein. Imagine the, the Kardashians, right? In real, in like the Keeping Up Kardashians, like a real version of that. Like them arguing about whoever stole their hair strain or something on there, something mundane as that. And then someone narrating about what led to this p- moment. Why is that person overreacting? Why is she, why does she have a, t- I don't know, something along those kind of lines. And there's loads of channels that do that stuff. And there's, and there's obviously, of course, the same sort of thing like this, where someone sits in front of a camera and talks about the news that's happening within the Angolan and Congolese kind of community. But there's a big, big, um, there's loads of channels about it. And I remember one time, I think I realized it, when um, I think my mum logged into my YouTube account. And she, you know, when you, when you log into someone else's YouTube account, you start watching other videos, the algorithm um, on YouTube kind of notices what you liked, what you didn't like, and starts recommending you shit. So I remember one day I just woke up and logged into my fucking YouTube and decided to watch, I was going to watch something and then, on my fucking home screen i saw tons of fucking african videos like just like what the fuck is going on and i really oh shit my mom logged into my account so i kind of got an understanding of it but um my mom's quite gossipy so i don't think it's that i just think maybe it's just a personality thing. i'm just not into it so i'm not gonna talk about all that kim kardashian 
Kanye Drake love triangle, Nick Cannon shit, because that's fucking gay. But it's interesting, um, Kanye's kind of approach now, since he's kind of decided to, quote unquote, move back to Chicago and the sort of reception that the kind of media or people in general have had towards it. And I think it's less of a conversation about Kanye and more so a conversation about, in general, how we kind of respond to people when they try and make amends, right? Um, so Kanye's obviously had a bit of an interesting year um, so far. You know, he's kind of had a lot of kind of public um, outbursts and breakdowns or breakthroughs, as he likes to call them, um, in general, which is, you know, it's nothing new if you're a Kanye fan. But it's kind of, I think for the first time, especially in hip hop, it seems like, because I've, I've, been, I've been okay with it because, you know, I grew up being a Morrissey fan and the Smiths, or the Smiths and the Morrissey fan, right? So I'm used to being, I'm used to having, I'm used to having conflicting um ideas on people who i deem to be musical geniuses right like if you like if you like the smiths and you like morrissey you there's a moment where you have to kind of really decide if you really like him because he's got some questionable political and societal ideas right really like that'll really drive most people away so the fans that are morrissey or smith fans now they don't care what he says they kind of put that to one side and just concentrate on the music so i think for the first time ever in hip-hop for most part especially someone popular i think it's easy to hate someone that you don't like right or it's easy to kind of discount someone that you don't really care for but i think because kanye has contributed so much to music or to culture overall people are really struggling are really kind of struggling what to do with this guy now that they have in front of them because it's not the same kind of we knew before because eh, he's old he's older now he's i'm not sure 40 something right so he's he's obviously older he's gone through a lot of different experiences he's a married man now he's got children he's got a multi-billion dollar company and easy like he's everything's changed in surroundings he's not he's not as dependent on having kind of co-signs from certain people like he's not trying to uh, break new ground he's not trying to break through doors break through walls he's in a whole different environment now so you know it's it makes sense that he's political or philosophical kind of uh leanings or uh foundations will kind of change somewhat along the way so people now have to kind of really come to grips of like can i still be a kanye fan and like what he says right um can i still be a fan of kanye's music like what he says so that's something you have to kind of internalize and kind of debate yourself. I'm I'm happy to do that. I think I'm happy depending on the crime. If it's like, you know, I don't know. Um, if, if, if this artist is raping kids or, you know, raping women or, I don't know, kidnapping people and shit, you know, I'm out or whatever, right, in general, right? But I think for the most part, I can put um, the person and the actual creative work or, you know, what they do to one side. I can put them on either ends, right? I can, I can uh, what's that word called? I can categorize things i can partition things right sort of like you know defragmentation on the pc i can defrag right i can put things in different compartments different positions and say okay cool let's leave that there so i'm, I'm okay with it. i'm fine I, I don't mind you can wire and do it what he wants i'm always going to enjoy the music i'm always going to check for his music right it might not be all to my taste at the moment like you know yay wasn't really my favorite but i thought kids see ghost was really cool i thought he did amazing job on pusha t's album i thought some of the bits on china taylor's album were great like i think the last the last single that he did with a uh, little pump even though people don't want to admit it, is probably as good if not as if not better than fucking tigers do 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 it's the same same sort of vein you feel like you shouldn't like it but do 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 but you should like it and it's like you know what is it how's that chorus go for kanye's track um uh, um you a hoe, you a hoe, something like that, um, slut, I don't know, something, I don't know, something about him fucking a hoe or something, right, so anyway, um, that track is really good, Lil Pump did, is actually, had a really good feature on that, actually, surprisingly, so, um, it's always, it's always nice when you have, it's always great to see, I think that's also a mark of somebody that's really talented, I think in Lil Pump, it's always awesome to see when Lil Pump is doing his own thing, he kind of he kind of phones it in in a way. Not phones it in, but he's got his pocket and he knows he can kind of just smash that, right? There's no there's no there's no trying, there's no effort there. Um, not effort. There's not. That's the wrong thing to say. He doesn't have to do. He doesn't have to work as hard to do his his sound right to work because it's his sound. But I like it when you hear someone like a little pump jump on a record with Kanye, who's you know even though he's a even though his output's a lot more quick, is a lot more he's turn he's turning tracks around a lot more quicker than he was before, right? He's not spending five hundred hours on a track on an album like he did with My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. It's always nice to see that when Pump goes and sits down with a really you know a, a fucking professional artist or professional musician in the fact of in the shape of um or compose or whatever you want to call him in the shape of Kanye West it's great to see that he can elevate what he does like he sounds amazing like on that Kanye track like um even his diction the way he's pronouncing words his flow his cadence like he sounds incredible he sounds perfect so you can tell that he is not not dumbing down what he does but you can tell that what he does comes easy comes natural 
and he doesn't need to try as hard as he as he wants. But if you want if you want him to try, he will try and he'll do that. Like sort of similar when you saw that video of Juice World doing a one hour freestyle on um, Westwood, right on um, Capital FM, whatever he did on, on video. You got to see, okay, cool. This this um, Juice World guy is you know, part of the mumble rap, SoundCloud emo rap community, but he can also freestyle. Like he can rap like anyone else can. So it wouldn't be surprised me if the next collaboration we, we hear with um, 6 ix 9 and Kanye, because we saw a lot of videos of him, it wouldn't surprise me if we hear the best version of 6 ix 9 with Kanye. Like, we're like, wow, the 6 ix 9 dude can actually rap. Like, he sounds amazing. His melodies are great. Like, I watch. I, I bet that happens, right? Anyway, so I'm always going to check for his music. Um, but it's interesting to see the backlash that Kanye is getting about the, the cynicism that's attached to Kanye going back to Chicago and sort of, like, connecting with his roots and kind of make, trying to make amends for some of the um, irresp quote, quote, irresponsible things he's done to the black community, which I don't think is irresponsible. I think you're allowed to have an opinion. I just think sometimes, um, I think sometimes people put too much credence in Kanye's opinion when he hasn't even fought it through himself. That's what I think. I think they take his what he says too seriously because I think he's been so serious of everything else he said in his life, right? For his whole career, he's been fucking so serious, so gung ho. He's been fighting the fight for everyone, right? That I think now because he doesn't say the things that people want to hear, uh, people take that that really seriously. And I just think for someone that hasn't really thought through what they said, and I, I don't know, he said recently in an interview with some Chicago dude that you know he doesn't read books and that he goes with his gut and he goes with what he feels. That kind of sounds a little bit Tea Party-ish. That kind of sounds a little bit Republican, a little bit you know what I mean, a little bit conservative. That, that's what someone would say that believes that. Um, who believes uh, Obama wasn't born in the USA, right? That he's somehow some sort of like, um, f you know, covert uh, ISIS plant who's actually praying secretly um, in the Oval Office or who was praying secretly in the Oval Office. That's that kind of logic of like, no, I, you watch those videos a lot um, when, they, when they go to conservative um, summits and they ask people questions about things and, you know, they present them facts. But they're like, no, I feel this. This is my feeling. This is what I'm going to go with. Like, I'm sorry, but... Your feelings cannot be trusted, man. Especially if they don't. Especially if they aren't grounded in anything. If you just like feel something, it just feels away about a, about about a system or about a political ideology or about a societal issue. That's a lot more complex than just a feeling, right? You can you have you might have a feeling of you know your point of view. I feel like this about something the way the world looks to me, but understanding the way politics work and having a really nuanced opinion on it you can't just go with feeling it's not really it's not the way to go you're not gonna you're not gonna come to an informed decision right um and if anything it's illustrated by the hysteria people have with these reactions i think when you go with feelings and you say bombastic stuff and people don't agree with it they're gonna flip out and you're seeing the reaction to it now and he isn't really apologizing for what he said he's not apologizing for standing next to trump he still likes trump he thinks trump's a quote unquote american um you know the archetypical american dream which some people could argue f in favor of like you know he, he did you know he was you know he didn't kind of like come up he didn't kind of um he didn't kind of come up from nothing in that respect he did you know his father was a successful businessman and he was given quote unquote a one million dollar loan which isn't you know people kind of scoff at that and say oh he was given one million dollar loan we don't have that kind of loan but i also don't think it, it should be kind of glossed over i don't think there's a lot of people out there who would be able to take one million dollars and be donald trump i don't think so i don't think that happens i think some people would probably spend a million dollars quicker than they think they would right some people wouldn't probably know how to manage it wouldn't know how to invest it so it's not an easy thing to do to kind of quote unquote you know some of the stuff he's done has been a bit shady but it's not easy to turn money into more money especially when you come from money i don't see where the desire would be to actually do it right that's why some of these rich kids that go out and make businesses or kind of try and give back or try and be entrepreneurial i think it needs to be credited they should people should clap like if you're rich and there's no rule they shouldn't like you know it's part of the reason why people make a business or you know facebook was basically started because you know mark zuckerberg was a lonely geek right he didn't have that many friends and he wanted to be quote unquote the center of attention or to connect with more people so some some of the greatest businesses that we have at the moment are kind of created because of a lack that someone has in their own life right they're trying to fill their own void or, or they're trying to provide for a family or they're trying to change the course of uh change direct the course direction of their family overall of their gen of, of their of their family history or whatever it may be right they're trying to employ some friends who they feel like they don't get the shine they need to get so for you to be rich at donald trump and to also you know do what he done and eventually become president i can see why um kanye would see him as an uh, as a you know as some sort of like um inspirational figure that you can kind of you know clap to because you know kind of said his whole career people said no and said he can't do certain things so maybe that is why he likes him but anyway he hasn't he hasn't apologized for all those things he just he's kind of apologizing for the way people feel about it and he's trying to re, re kind of you know redo his image he's going back to chicago 
And at the moment, people are a bit cynical about it, saying that it's a rebrand and he's not, you know, you hear a lot on the Joe Budden podcast that, oh, it's a rebrand and it won't be long until he goes to Harold's Chicken, which I'm assuming is like, um, Harold's must be like the Morley's of Chicago and quote, and you know, and, and right on cue, Kim Kardashian posts a picture of her eating Harold's Chicken. So it's like, you know, he's doing the whole rebrand. He's completely, he's moving his family. Oh, he's, he's moving permanently to Chicago now, which I don't really believe, you know. I don't think he's going to totally leave LA. He's got probably a lot of things to handle in LA still. Um, the house that he kind of did. He didn't really do a tour of the house, but the interior looked really nice when he had the interview with Charlemagne. So I don't know, maybe he will. Like, maybe he'll follow through with it. Because um, so far he's kept his promises, hasn't he? He did say he's going to drop those albums. A lot of people didn't think he was going to drop them, but he actually did. Um, they all came out on time, I think, apart from Tiana Taylor's, right? For the most part. Um so yeah, he's trying to he's trying to rebrand himself. He is trying to make amends because I think he's realizing. Maybe he's not realizing now, but I think is he realizing. I don't know what he realizes, but I, I just think in general, not to be gossipy about people's business, but I just think in general, I think this should be a lesson to all that you know people should be allowed to make amends, however heavy-handed it might look like right i think you should be allowed to make amends and to make an effort i think you should be judged by your actions right and not by what you say so i think if he consistently tries to go out of his way not to annoy people right and not to rub them up the wrong way just because he can right just because he can turn on the the kind of hype switch and get people interested in what he has to do because some people would argue that he's he only does this when he wants to sell something to people right and he's got loads of yeezys coming out and all that malarkey and he's opening new offices of yeezy and all that stuff people are kind of getting cynical about that but i think if he's trying to recap if he's trying to um reconstruct his image or trying to repair damage that he's done or that he feels like people are disappointed in that's all that's all well and good in my opinion i think he should be allowed to do so the only the only thing that's a really interesting the subtext of it is like you know the kind of line you said about missing don c and then you see an image of don c with virgil when he's djing at the drake's um block party thing in new york that's the thing that i'd be you know I'd, i kind of see where his kind of pain will come from but then again i don't know where where the split happened i don't know where it suddenly because you know even looking at the pictures you see of kanye around they're not the same people that are around him from before i don't buy into the whole um uh black twitter mo um kind of you know um narrative that kanye needs a black woman in his life to hold him down which kind of insinuates that kanye needs more black people in his life to hold him down or to kind of pull him up in the stuff that he's saying i don't think that's true and i think it's a little bit i think it's a little bit disingenuous uh it's disrespectful um and it also doesn't make any sense. Just because you're black doesn't mean you're going to talk sense about a uh, an issue that affects black people. It doesn't make any sense. You know, I don't represent all black people and they don't either. So they're talking out their ass in that respect. But it does it does seem interesting that um, for some people, especially the biggest stars, they do tend to keep the same people around them for grounding purposes, it seems like, right? Because when you get really big um, and you become a real big global icon, it, you can sometimes lose a perception of reality. And you sometimes need people who are with you uh, sleeping on a futon somewhere in a dusty apartment in the middle of Chicago to still be there when you're selling out arenas and selling shoes out in two seconds and to kind of like, you know, to bring you down a notch, quote unquote, right? Um, to kind of just give you, just kind of give you some grounding, right? To tell you when you're acting out because those are the people that are going to do it. The people that you hire, um, that are paid to kind of make sure that your success aren't necessarily going to pull you up on your bullshit because their job is dependent on it, right? Or if you make them, or if you give, you know, if you're a manager, you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're not going to be the voice of reason in the room with Kanye. That doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, that kind of star power does that. But it is interesting to see that a lot of the people that are around him in the beginning or even during the My Be Able to the Fancy era aren't necessarily there now in the pictures. Maybe they don't want to take pictures and shit, but you don't really see them being talked about or mentioned in the music and he kind of alluded to it when he said that don c isn't around anymore he started, and then he started crying when he started reminiscing about it so it must be a bit weird to see his friend that who's crying about who's not necessarily around anymore on the stage with drake who they're now having this big public beef about it must be strange but again like i said i don't want to get in the chat gossip back i don't know what the fuck's going on it's cool this could all be wrestling this could all be a simulation we don't know but i think Kanye should be allowed to rehabilitate himself if he is going back to chicago and trying to do make amends and make some sort of an impact there with you know the gun crime and all that malarkey and trying to reconnect with some of the guys from the drill scene who he kind of tapped into when he was doing making Yeezus and stuff like still blood on the leaves still one of my favorite tracks um then yeah let him do it man and also i give him credit man that whole yeezy 350 triple white um everyone's gonna get a pair thing is amazing i got the link the other day i didn't buy a pair but i got a link the other day um with an email link to go buy it look through all sizes available 165 pounds you could buy them right there like he followed through on his promise man like credit like 
like bravo to Kanye. He followed through on his promise. Everyone wears three fifties now. It's probably one of the most popular shoes, right? I think the same person that used to wear Hirachis or Vans. Remember that period where everyone was wearing Vans, um, old schools and um, skate highs and stuff. Like that same person that wears those things is now wearing three fifties. I see them everywhere. They're really, really popular. And I think in terms of the in terms of hype sneaker, they probably might be the most popular hype sneaker out there. Like um, overall, in terms of like the new shapes, not not like you know limited edition Air Force Ones or whatever. But in terms of what people are wearing now, you see a lot of people wearing. They don't really see people wearing Jordans anymore, which might explain them fucking doing a collaboration with Nigel Sylvester and a collaboration with Pip, with Paris Saint Germain, the football club. It's like insane. Jordan Brand's fucking dying a slow, slow death, a death by a, a, a thousand cuts, or whatever. Um, so it's great to see that happening. He's supplying everyone. Everyone's getting a pair, um, which is amazing. I don't care if they're fake. I don't care if they're real. Everyone's getting a pair. Like he's changing the kind of language. The kind of, that, that's what I think must be amazing when you're creative. I, I guess it must be annoying when people make fake stuff of your items, but it also must be an amazing when they make fake stuff because it's an acknowledgement that your thing, you, the thing that you've made, has penetrated like pop culture. Because it means everyone wants it. Because they don't really make fake um, niche products. They don't exist, right? No one's making fake, I don't know, um, Sennheiser HD25 headphones, right? That's a very niche kind of thing. But if, if Sennheiser headphones became Beats by Dre, there'd be fake ones everywhere. I, I'm sure they exist, but they don't because they're not Beats by Dre. So I think if you're Beats by Dre and they make fake um, headphones, I do think it's good because what it means is that everyone around the world who doesn't know there's fake headphones will just see that shape and went, oh, I want that shape. And then you'll tell them it's beast and then they'll go and buy a pair. So it's like for every person that buys a fake one, there'll be three or four that'll buy a real one. So that must be amazing to see if you're a Kanye that everyone's kind of changed it. The silhouette has changed in terms of trainer and it's kind of gone to this whole like sock thing, which a lot of people are kind of now implementing and whatever. So that must be cool. Um, so I'm credit to him. But I heard a story actually the other day that supposedly a lot of retailers turned down the triple whites because they were, they were so available everywhere. And the same thing happened with the Wave Runners. So I just want to say publicly, like, fuck those retailers and fuck the brands because this kind of does lend to this new story that came out the other day about Ticketmaster, that Ticketmaster was supposedly, uh, allegedly in this story, that they were doing some insider trading where they were purposely selling tickets to staff or to ticket touts because they could then claim um, kickbacks, right? They can basically double their money that way. So because, you know, if you've, if you've realized whenever there's a big act who's got, act, who's got a concert... Um, or tickets available on Ticketmaster, it's always really difficult to get them, right? Because, you know, you have to go through the captures and all that sort of malarkey. Are you a robot? Are you not? And all that stuff, right? And then by the time you get through to collect a seat, you're always kind of in the bleachers, right? In the nosebleeds, like fucking terrible seats. So this kind of investigation uncovered that there's some insider trading going on. There's some, uh, there's some um, really dodgy shit going on in the background that's leading to uh, public, the, you know, the the paying public such as myself not being able to buy tickets when we want and i've always i've always theorized in my head anyway not said it verbally that i think a lot of that stuff happens a lot with the brands a lot with the retailers that they purposely uh manif they purposely like you know sell stuff to certain people so resellers who you see posting um runs of trainers at a markup right and then sell a small portion of those available online i'm pretty sure i don't think if a store gets 100 pairs of shoes that they're selling 100 pairs of shoes online after you take after you account for the stuff they discounts and for the friends and family some of that stuff is goes to resellers who are happy to pay uh two times on each pair in order to kind of get them uh from the back door i'm sure that happens i've done i don't have a i don't have any proof but i'm 100 percent sure that happens having worked in the shop myself and seeing what people do when limited edition shoes come in right because I've, I've been the recipient of um the fruits of that right when i've been able to buy three pairs of yeezys the first ones with nike and i bought them right um for retail when they came out um and i've seen what people do when they kind of want to get free shoe they kind of scratch someone's back there so i'm sure if you're a big brand or a big retailer you can scale that and make some fucking big big money that you can kind of you know write off whatever or give a bonus to whoever manages that store so i'm sure that happens so a lot of these brands a lot of these stores now with sneaker with the sneaker industry being a billion dollar industry and the streetwear being the fucking dominant uh form of fashion for most uh young people in the world regardless of where they live right it doesn't make any sense that some of these limited edition shoes that everyone kind of wants no one can get them right look at the iphone like the iphone is probably one of the most popular items out there it sells all all year round it's probably the most well sold it's pro i'm assuming it's probably the one of the most well sold smart smartphones in the entire world and you can always get one even if it's even if you can't walk into a store and get one straight because it's sold out you can get it within a couple of days they put your name down listen they'll alert you when it comes back in store you can always get an iphone but for the, but for some reason you can't get a pair of yeezys 
right? Or some or some form of Yeezys. You can't get um, a pair of React 87s when they first come out, right? Because supposedly they're only limited edition. Like they are doing that on purpose. They're for, they're 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 manufacturing scarcity in the hope that it drives kind of virality on the internet, and then which in turn would drive desire and hype, which in turn drive queues. They can get that on their social. The the fucking um, retailer that's doing it can do a raffle that requires people to enter their email addresses that puts them on their email database so they can sell them more shit uh the store can do following requests on social media that go and increase their social media following count it's all a big fucking game and it's absolutely annoying because as this and no it's annoying too because even if i'm somebody that's just complaining or whining because i get l's all the time right because i've only won a raffle once successfully in my life right but even if it's just me whining and getting l's let's imagine um the consumer base right just grows up i'm older now right so i'm an i'm an, I'm an older dude so imagine the guys grow up. So imagine the guys who are 18 to 25 now just get older and they have more disposable income because that scarcity of resources or of um, of products in general only works when kids don't have that much money, right? Because they're taking a shoe and they're flipping it and then, you know, or maybe taking two shoes and then keeping one, flipping the other one and then taking that money and buying something else and then that's how they're building their collection or they're building their reselling empire. But that only works when kids don't have that much money because they're kind of, you know, they're, 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 they're what you call it, they're, making, they're spending money in order to make money. But once you get older and you start not caring about queuing up because, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's not that many 30 year olds. There's not that many 40 year olds in queues anymore. Um, I remember when we were first buying trainers, there were a lot of 30 year olds and 40 year olds in queues because that was the people that were buying the shoes. For the most part, everyone that's buying the shoes was an adult, right? Like I, I was young when I came into the scene, but for the most part, there wasn't really a lot of young kids. Now there's a lot of young kids in the queues, right? But that that's only cool when you're young it's not it doesn't get cool when you're older to stand inside standing in front of in standing in the queue especially all the time for shoes i think for some shoes you probably should stand in queue for but i don't think for every shoe that's limited you should be standing in the queue for it's like supreme drops right every drop is a queue it's not every drop it should be some drops should be a queue which anyway that that's another story but what happens when that community or that group of kids gets older right they're gonna have more disposable income and then and they they, they won't mind uh, spending an extra hundred pounds to get the shoe that they want, but they don't want to queue. So keep manufacturing this hype, keep creating this false sense of scarcity. Eventually, people just get tired of it, right? And that's what's happened to me. I just get tired of it, and what I do, I I, I focus my attention on StockX, and now all my spending power, all my kind of re all my kind of like looking at what dropping goes directly to StockX. I don't care about a reseller anymore because I don't because I don't care because I know most likely when that shoe drops, I won't have the money to buy it when it drops in the middle of the month, right? Or I won't have the money to buy it anywhere. Or I won't be aware of the, when the shoe is dropping. But I'll be aware when I see on StockX. And I don't mind paying the extra $150 to, to get the shoe. Like, and not have to queue up. I don't mind doing that because I'm an adult, right? I can save money, right? Um, or I, I make enough money to buy these things. And I'm sure it's going to happen again with this generation that are coming up. The fucking 15-year-olds uh, to 25, not even 18, 15, or even younger than that, 13 year old. When they get older, when they start making more money, they will suddenly start realizing that, you know what? This queue thing is fucking bullshit. And they do it all the fucking time. It's like Jordan's. That's why Jordan's died, right? They kept making every, they kept retroing every single model every couple of years, but not really improving the last, not really improving the materials. And then the Jordan diehards who kept complaining about it, they weren't kept paying attention to. They kind of kind of were a bit ambivalent to them and kind of like poo-pooed them away because I'm sure Jordan must make... Um, I imagine Jordan Brand must make insane amount of money just set, reselling fucking jerseys with Jordan on the back of it, right? Or from shorts or from sweatbands. They just make... It's like Nike. They make... They must make so much money from Air Force Ones that all this other shit is just like fun. It's just like fun money to play around with. That's why they can build a whole fucking center at Oregon where they just kind of like... um What's that? I forgot what it's called. They just like research materials and come up with cool new ideas for cushioning and whatever. Because you just make so much money from like inline stuff that gets sold in JD. But I think they need they will reach a breaking point. So credit to Kanye for finally d doing away with it and just making the shoes available, right? You can buy Yeezys even if they're on resale. You can get Yeezys for under two hundred quid, like because they're so available now. The demand's dropped. But then some retailers I've heard again, I'm not I've not got any proof of it, but some retailers supposedly I've been told uh, didn't want to take the Yeezy three hundreds, three fifties, white and triple whites because they were so av ready available. Like, go fuck yourself, right? Because you couldn't manufacture scarcity. Go jump off a cliff. I hope your business fails. Like, fuck that. I'm, I'm annoyed by it. So it's just annoying. If the sneaker industry is a billion-dollar industry, why can't we just buy our shoes from the retailers or from the brands that sell them? It's all fucking some big convoluted nonsense where you have to download an app, notify yourself, wait. It's like, it's so, it's so clunky and it's so fucking prehistoric, right? That you have to download an app and then get notified via email 
or via no it's like it's so clunky like what the fuck is this like think creatively like think of a cool idea to get us a shoot like a queue online like we have now now they're not now you're not queuing in person you have to queue on the internet like do you know how dumb or nuts that sounds right like you did do you know people out there who kind of laugh at people who go and queue for burgers i remember we used to do it back in the day right we used to go and queue for burgers right limited um not like really cool burgers you know back in the day when the whole pop-up thing was first getting started and food trucks and shit it was cool because what usually happened was that the food truck was a speciality uh, truck right so somebody had gone this the whole so everyone had the same trope the same story same narrative right they traveled around the world they went to this interesting place and they had this amazing thing that they thought they'd want to bring back and share with the world right or share with their community or share with wherever they are located in and the thing that made those things amazing was because it came from such a pure place right i had this amazing napoleon pizza right so i want to take that recipe and bring it to london right so i want to import the fucking water that they're using right the yeast the flour and make it exactly how i, I had it there and make it here so people can have a taste of, of italy uh, whilst they're sitting in the middle of camberwell that's amazing because that that restaurant is just concentrating on that thing right they've got that they've got a what in, in startup conversation they've got one vertical and it's pizza right they don't they don't do everything else they don't make fucking chipotle shit they don't make cupcakes they just make pizza and they fucking smash it right so the beginning when it was just a, a niche industry or whatever or niche scene queuing for for a burger a street truck makes made sense right because this wasn't something that was um embraced by the populace overall by the general public right because that's that's what it is if it's a small thing and there's loads of you interested in it or loads if there's more than 10 of you interested and they've only got five seats in there there's going to be a queue right but then once it becomes popular and becomes big these now you know like a whole small whatever for instance or sorry, um whatever the other burger shops are called they can then go from a food truck to a restaurant which then enables more people to eat in the restaurant and then when you get more bigger you get more successful investors come on board and then they allow you to then branch out and open franchise or open other chains in other places around the country so that everyone can have a chance to eat your amazing shit that everyone's raving about and then your job then is just to make sure you can maintain consistency right you maintain you maintain levels of production you mean make sure that it's as good it's hard to do to make sure you know that your thing you to do in a food truck which is you and your friends with just the love of it and used to sit and research it's now turned into a bit of a job I'm, I'm sure it's hard to take that food truck thing and replicate the successes in restaurants or nationwide but that's what you try and do but if you're nike and you're whatever and it's you know it was foot patrol that was selling like you know uh, three or four limited edition shoes that people were queuing up for and they maybe were selling out in the in 24 hours and not in the space of one hour and but now it's a billion dollar industry and people are making careers of just reviewing shoes on fucking YouTube and holding them up with their face and doing those dumb faces, right? If that's the industry now that is is it's kind of permeated through and it's, it's involved in pop culture and people are taking pictures of people that wear shoes in public and shit, uh, celebrity sneakers uh, spotlighting, whether it's called whatever that malarkey. If that's true, then give us the fucking shoes, man. Like give us the shoes. It's, it's insane. It's nuts. It's so nuts, right? That some celebrities uh, hire little ch like kids who are on the internet to buy them shoes because they can't get them themselves. Imagine you're fucking Kevin Hart, right? You're sponsored by Nike, and even you can't get some shoes. So you have to employ a a, a, a kid that's obsessed with sneakers to kind of make sure he gets the shoes for you, however he may get them, and then you don't mind paying him a bit of a markup or or selling him some tickets. Like it's insane. Imagine you're Kevin Hart and you can't get a fucking pair of Nike Reacts. Like, huh? Just make the shoes available, man. Honestly, so it's annoying. So anyway, in, in closing, in closing, thank, um, clap to Kanye for coming through with his promise. He smashed it and he did it and he didn't, you know, waver. Um, he actually did his promise and supplied everyone three fifties, which is why you see three fifties everywhere. If you go, you know, where I am or where I work near Old Street in Shoreditch area, like all the people that want to look cool or want to look hip, or whatever, they all wear three fifties, man. They're everywhere. Such a popular shoe. So fucking credit to Kanye for actually following through on a promise. That's amazing. But I hope more brands do it too, man. It's annoying, man. Come on, man. We're grown ups. Like the the industry is blooming. It's a billion dollar industry. Everyone wants a part of the pie. Everyone wants to eat. Everyone wants to dress well. Everyone wants a nice trainer. Just allow us to buy the shoe. God damn it. Anyway, I've been rambling a lot about that. I'm sorry about this. Um, whew, it's nearly an hour. Um, actually, you know what? Let me continue on. NFL player retires at halftime. I'm sure you guys might have seen this, right? Um, there's a story of this NFL player who retired at half during one. I don't know at halftime because I don't watch American football, right? Um, he retired at halftime. He retires... And there's a big kind of backlash happening around it. That everyone's kind of getting annoyed about. Um, that's his name. Vontae Davis. 
Okay, so Vonte Davis, um, I'm going to get this up on the screen, but I'm going to read the article for you guys so you guys can hear about this. But I saw this kind of pop up on my Twitter feed. Twitter's amazing for that, right? I, that's why I get most of my news. I get my news from BBC News and Twitter for the most part. Twitter's not great because, you know, I, I, I try and follow people that I don't really agree with. Like, I follow loads of really angry feminists on Twitter who kind of always have... A v it's interesting to see the way they interpret news, right? So there'll be an article... There was, imagine, there was a, again, not to quickly, before I talk about Vontae Davis, there was this feminist on Twitter who I follow, um, and she got really annoyed that um, the gamer Ninja, who's really popular on Twitch, who kind of Drake had a, uh, who, who Twitch, who Drake joined on Twitch when they were playing Fortnite, um, this, he's really popular, he's like one of the biggest uh, streamers on Twitch, um, he dyes his hair blue or different colours, you've probably seen him, Ninja or whatever, um, this feminist on Twitter got really angry that Ninja uh, was the cover was on the cover that like he was the cover star for ESPN or one of those one of those esports games um, magazines. I think it's ESPN or something on the lines. He, he was he was on the cover for it, and she got annoyed and she was like, "Ah, oh, how can you put this guy on a cover when he would, when he doesn't want to play with women on stream because he's afraid of what people might say? Like he's he's kind of like um, in her kind of in her thinking, he's kind of." playing into the idea that women are toxic and i don't know it's sort of like playing into the patriarchy or whatever her point is right that's that was her perspective on it like so all the gamers all the people that are involved in uh, social media or involved in content generation or are in kind of internet personalities saw that and were like oh that's amazing man well done ninjas on the front cover of a magazine right it's like imagine you know it's like it's like someone that's it's like taking an internet meme star and putting them in front of vogue magazine right it's like a big deal like wow this you know like Joanna the scammer, right? Imagine she made the or he made the whatever that 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 um that comedic kind of satirist actor that was around for a bit. Not really, I don't see him in any more videos of Joanna the scammer or Joanna the Joanna the scammer. I think it's Joanna the scammer. Imagine she had a picture on the front of a Vogue Paris magazine wearing like a mink coat with that kind of face that um she does, right? Everyone would be freaking out. So, but it'll be interesting on the other side of it because that's why Twitter is good to follow the other accounts that don't always agree because I'm, I'm sure there'll be another a Twitter account hypothetically who would see that image and be like, oh, Joanna Scammer, uh, another social media uh, star taking jobs away from hardworking models, right? There'll be that respect. So Twitter is good for it because you can purposely go and follow people who have opposing views than your own. So then when the news does come through because of the algorithms, you kind of get different perspectives on the same bit of news, right? Um, but then sometimes as well, it can be a bit of an echo chamber because you end up following people that you just agree with. And, you know, that wasn't a good thing. But so I get my news from Twitter and BBC News. And I saw this pop up and I thought it was really interesting because it kind of made me think about the David Beckham story when he retired. So this guy called Vontae Davis, again, I don't have any, any idea about NFL. The only, I know, and the only thing I know about NFL is that they dance when they do a touchdown, right? Like, that's the only thing I fucking know about. I don't know jack shit about the NFL. So, um, and black people seem to be really good at it for some reason. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so Vontae Davis from the Buffalo Bills, a cornerback, retires at halftime of an NFL match, right? So this is a story that popped up that I thought was fucking really interesting to kind of delve into just in general about psyche and about sports and just, you know, how people see, how people look at quitting or how people look at, um, I don't know, just how people interpret some stuff, right? It's very, very interesting. So, uh, Dante Davis, Davis, Buffalo Bills cornerback, retires at halftime of NFL match. It's reason on BBC. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link it in the show notes so you guys check it yourself. But I'll read it out. Buffalo Bills cornerback Vontae Davis retired from NFL at halftime in his size 31-20 loss, right? This is the big thing to, to also keep in mind. Uh, against Los Angeles Chargers on Sunday. They, they lost the game. Uh, Davis uh, started the game but said he had the honest moment with himself during it and told the size coach Steve McDermott that he was done. He later issued a statement saying he had not intended to show any disrespect to his teammates or coaches. He said in his statement, I'm going to scroll down to every statement and just read out his statement, right? Um... He said in his statement here, uh, this is how I pictured retiring from the NFL. And it's a picture of him uh, with a touchdown, I'm assuming, right? holding the ball in his hand. But in my 10th NFL season, which is quite long, considering most, I hear a lot of people say you don't, you, you won't be, um, what is this? I hear a lot of people say with NFL that sometimes it's hard to even be three years. I don't know, something, it's, it's I guess because it's so physically demanding, even though they got all the padding and stuff, like I'm assuming because of the seasons, how much they have to travel, that, you know, it, you, it's not a league where you can hang around in your 40s. You know what I mean? People have like, it's a short run. So he has 10 seasons. So that means, you know, he's fairly um, successful and, and really good at what he does. Um, he's been, he's continued and says, I've been doing what my body has been programmed to do. Get ready to play on game day. 
Um, I've endured multiple surgeries and played through many different injuries throughout my career. And over the last few weeks, this was the last latest, la latest physical challenge. But today on the field, reality hit me fast and hard. I shouldn't be out there anymore. I meant no disrespect to my teammates and coaches, but I hold myself to a, to a standard. Mentally, I, was, I always expect myself to play at a high level, but physically, I know today that isn't possible. And I had an honest moment with myself while I was on the field, and I just didn't feel right. And I told the coaches, I'm not feeling like myself. I also wondered, do I want to keep sacrificing? And truthfully, I do not because the season is long. And it's more important for me and my family to walk away a healthy man than to willfully embrace the warrior mentality and limp away too late. This was an overwhelming decision, but I'm at peace with myself and my family. I chose to be grateful to God for allowing me to play the game that I have loved as a boy until I turned 30. So again, imagine he mentioned before his 10th season and he says that he's blessed to be able to play until 30, which gives us the, which, which allows us to have assume that it's quite rare for a player to, to kind of be successful or to carry on playing in the NFL over 30 years of age, right? I chose to be grateful to God for being part of the for being part of the NFL and making lifelong friends over the last decade. There were roadblocks and pitfalls along the way, but I'm grateful to God for all the all of it because he doesn't promise any of us an easy journey. Last year I'm grateful to God, loads of God talk man, for what he has has in store on me ahead in the next chapter of my life. So interesting kind of um interesting thing that a, a player would do right at half time he decides that the game he, he he's loved for his entire life the game that he's sacrificed a lot of things for um he has now kind of it's come to roost and he kind of now feels that like he can't do it any longer and he wants to tap out so a lot of criticism that i saw online about this whole issue was the fact that he kind of left at half time right and supposedly the story is that he kind of just didn't tell any of his teammates and sort of just left and kind of informed only his coach I'm sorry, people saying he kind of let his teammates down in that respect. He should have been man enough to kind of man up and tell them at half time. But there is an opposite side of it where you could say maybe that's the worst thing to do, right? Maybe at half time, whilst your teammates are trying to um, claw back, um, are trying to claw back points because I think they lost overall, right? So maybe they were down when they went into half time. It probably might be the worst time to then, uh, hey guys, I know we're losing this game and we're getting absolutely smashed. But by the way, I'm retiring. Peace. That's not probably the best thing to do. So maybe leaving before anyone sees you is probably a good thing and before anyone even realizes that you're not even there right it's sort of probably similar to people's thinking it's like you know when you've ever been to a party and you say bye to everyone and then and then when you go out you realize your uber's not there yet or your i don't know whatever your transport means you're not there yet, or it's raining and you have to then go back into that party that you then spent 10 minutes saying everyone bye to i mean it's just a bit embarrassing sometimes because I used to get a bit annoyed when people who used to used to, I used to go out with sometimes you'd go out with them and then they'd just disappear at the end of the night. They'd just go home. But then I started to realize that actually it is a bit weird to kind of go and seek somebody out and say, hey, by the way, I am leaving now. Bye. As a grown adult. Like, you know I mean, if someone leaves, they leave, isn't it? No big deal. Especially if you're in a bar, you might end up speaking to somebody else anyway. It's not that big of a deal. Unless you're maybe together and it's just like two of you. And if that person decides just to leave and not tell you, that's a bit of a dick move. But if you guys are a group, I don't think you're required to tell everyone that you have to leave. But it made me think this story a lot, uh, more so about more than, more so than house parties. Made me think a lot about David Beckham. David Beckham had a really interesting story when he mentioned that when he decided, decided to retire, right? Because David Beckham, towards the end of his career, especially towards the end of Manchester United career, he was his powers were kind of waning, right? Um, Alex Ferguson had a big kind of bust up with him on a, uh, on the pitch, which kind of led to the boot flying across the changing room, which kind of gave him a nook on his eye. Um, and he kind of suffered a lot, right, in the last few seasons of of Man United, and, and he kind of had they had to leave, and then you know, uh, begrudgingly, unfortunately, he had to go to Real Madrid, right? Do you know what I mean, imagine leaving United and going to Real Madrid. So he kind of then went to Real Madrid, bounced around a bit, went to AC, then went to PSG, went to Los Angeles Galaxy. So he had a um, he had a weird kind of end of his career, but at towards the end, it kind of seemed like it was go like he was not going to be at his powers, but he did kind of um, uh, he did kind of prove everyone wrong, and he performed really well, especially at PSG. He had a really some uh, some really stellar performances there, so he kind of proved it. But I remember he mentioned towards the end that. He decided to retire. The reason why he decided to retire from football is because he always said to himself, if he ever woke up in the morning and didn't feel like going training, he'd have to retire. And in his whole entire career of everything he's gone through, surgeries, um, celebrity fucking mishaps and all that sort of gossip stuff he's gone through, raising a family, traveling everywhere, um, you know, moving clubs, learning a new language or whatever it may be, right? He, he never once uh, felt, didn't feel like going to train, right? And training, I think, will be similar to, you know, me wake, w w waking up and working out in the morning. There are certain days you wake, wake up, you're like, oh, do I have to go out and run? You're just not in the mood. But he said his barometer of realizing when he's not, he should retire is when he doesn't feel like going training. 
And I think that's a really good uh, thing to say because what it means is that sometimes in life, just because you can do something, right, it doesn't mean you should do it. Sometimes if your body just says no, you should kind of listen to it. I know I've kind of always said, you know, you should listen to your feelings, but I think sometimes there does come a moment in life where if you're, if it starts to become a chore, if you start whining and complaining, I think instead of staying and trying to be Che Guevara and fucking revolutionize and radicalize or change everything in order to fit the way it can, to, in, order to, in order to make you feel more comfortable, in order to kind of help you sleep better at night, sometimes it's better just to kind of move and change a scenario and change a bit of scenery. I see a lot happen in workplaces, right? Where people have a tendency to moan a lot at workplace, especially when it's like, um, I think you hear it a lot, especially when it's like an entry level job, right? Because usually those kind of roles are, you know, they're a bit monotonous. They don't require any kind of, they're not, they're not really stretching. They're not really requiring you to dig deep into your arsenal of IQ skills, right? They don't require that much mental acumen in order to kind of do the job. So it does maybe tend to bring out the whinger in people because you're doing something repetitively day in, day out. But I think for the most part, people just don't tend to complain anyway, especially in, 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 in England anyway. People just tend to whinge about things, maybe because of weather, maybe because of our, our temperament, I don't know. But it always, it always surprises me when people whinge a lot at work about work things when work is the one thing that can change, right? But the people around you, you can't. You can't change your manager. You can't change processes unless you're a senior figure. And even if you can change processes, it doesn't, you can't do it overnight. There's a lot of things that you can't do as an employee, right? Um, that sometimes, what one thing you can do that you can control is move. It's change. It's change the scenario. Just go somewhere else. But people don't want to do that. People would much rather just stay and whinge. And I don't know what that is about. But I think in sports, People are people have the same sort of thing too. You see a lot of players sometimes hold on for too long, right? Um, or complain about injuries or complain they're not playing enough. Like there's an article recently with Theo Walcott um, saying that he fell out of love with football at Arsenal because he wasn't playing enough games. But you look at Theo Walcott and you say, that's your own fault, mate. You're, you're a bit naive. Like he, he was never going to be uh, a starting striker playing through the middle for Arsenal ever. It was never going to happen because he, he never really demonstrated that he could be trusted uh, for a whole season. Or he could argue maybe in his defense that he wasn't given opportunity to show that he could be trusted. But um, it seemed like Ar Arsene Wenger every season would promise that he'd play more as a striker. And every season he would never start as many games as he wanted to start, right? He was never pleased with the amount of starts he did. But I guess his personality and I guess the fact that Arswinger brought him from Southampton when he was really young, he kind of had an emotional connection to him and he kind of never went to kind of let him go. He kind of went for awkward to make decisions himself. He kind of never went to kind of force him out of the club. He just kind of ha had him hanging around, right? So players like that kind of, they don't realise that, you know, even though he's complaining a lot about his current situation, Fiorco can just leave. He could just talk to his agent and talk to the club and say that, look, I'm not playing enough games. I want, I, can you, I want you guys to be open to offers. So if someone comes in, don't tell them no. Tell them I'm open to speak, right? Because I want to go somewhere else. And I think as De this Devontae Davis, as annoying it must be as a teammate, as annoying it must be if you're a fan of the Buffalo Bills, that some, one of your players decided to retire at halftime, I think you have to respect the athlete who's actually doing the job, who's actually going to training every morning, who's sacrificing their family and friends, right? Who kind of, I remember some athletes saying along the lines of something along the lines of, I don't forget who it was, said something like, they only see their family two times a month. Like, <laughs> There's some people at my workplace who complain they don't see their boyfriend. They haven't seen their boyfriend in a week. Imagine not seeing your wife, your wife and kids, and you're a fucking multi-millionaire in two months, like or twice a month. That must be insane, right? Because um, you're traveling so much, whatever it may be, right? For your uh, for your job of being a professional athlete. So, I think we have to trust the athlete. We have to trust that being ten seasons into the after NFL, right? playing as much as he has done, uh, being 10 seasons in, keeping his spot. Because again, that's something that you don't, people don't need to, people don't ra realize, in, don't put enough emphasis on. It's not the fact that you've made it, right? Because making it in, af in, in athletics is insane, right? Because, you know, it's the top 1% of the 1% make it, right? Not like, the, I think now, I think in some, especially in football and soccer, as you call it in the US, there is a thing where, uh, some clubs now I think I've instead of that because I think before they used to say that if you haven't made it, if you're not professional as a football player by 18, then you're not going to make it. But now I think they've taken it to 21, which is still not long enough, right? It's for some people. But so imagine you're, you're, you're putting a time limit. There's a talent limit. 
there's a size and stature limit in some respects. Some countries, you know, so especially in England, a lot of kids suffer because they, they're really technically gifted, but they're too small. And a lot of the kids that play in youth leagues or play in under 21s or especially for the bigger clubs, they sometimes they um, sign players from different countries who are really big or really muscular to come play in the league or they, or they only look for players who are really strong and physically capable. So if you're a young player and you're the size of David Silva uh, or you imagine you're small, you're like a Gianco Franco Zola when you were 16 and you're playing uh, League One football for an under 18 team, it's going to be really difficult for you to make it. So there's limits in your age. They put boundaries, they put limits on your uh, talent, they put limits on your size, they put limits on your um, loca locale. Maybe, you know, if you're in a certain town that's got. Um, that's, that's got an overabundance of talented players. It's going to be difficult to you to make it in that respect, right? Like there's a there's limit. If 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 it's the opposite and there's not that many good players, you're not going to be as good as the people from the other city who have better players. There's limits, right? So by the time you get to professional level, you've you've kind of you've kind of beat so many different people that it's insane, right? You're really really you're really fucking talented. You're really fucking good at what you do. So not not a lot of people give enough credence to the fact that if you've made it right it's a it's a it's like wow amazing but if you keep your spot for 10 years it's insane because that means in each cycle of new kid graduating from a university i don't know every couple of years or whatever you've been able to maintain your spot that's nuts to, to see that so he's able to do that so if he's if he's come to the end of that point and says you know what that was the time i think it's cool man it's half time. I don't think why. What's the point? Running out somewhere and you don't feel like doing something is horrible. Like I, you hear horror stories all the time in MMA of people fighting in a cage, right? Because they need to pay off bills or because they don't have any money. They're not doing it for the love of the game. They're not doing it because they enjoy the physical aspect of it, the tactical aspect of like defeating somebody with your hands, elbows, knees, and legs. No, they're doing it because they have to pay bills. Imagine what that must feel like. Imagine being in a ring with somebody who wants to rip your head off right but you're only in there because you want to pay your bills like who do you think is going to win like do you know what i mean like, that's scary that is a scary fool or you're in there only because you have nothing else to offer the world you think so you, you again i don't think i think everyone has anything to offer but imagine if you're a fighter and you've only fought you don't have any qualifications you don't have any businesses you don't have any decent sponsors that are making that are bringing in that enough money in order to sustain your your uh, uh lifestyle right Imagine having to get into the ring just to do that, just, just to, just to fucking go on holiday. That must be insane to buy your wife a wedding ring. That must be nuts. So if some, if some people are able to realize when's a good time to leave a sport like the NFL, especially with the whole CTE stuff and the concussions and whatever, you know that guy recently, Aaron, Her Aaron Hernandez, who ended up killing I think three people or whatever. Right, he went to prison, ended up um, um, committing suicide, and then they analyzed his brain, and supposedly he had a brain of a sixty-seven-year-old or some shit like that. Right, it was complete mush. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse his horrendous act, but Jesus Christ, man, he was under thirty, and his brain was that of a sixty-year-old. That's nuts. So if this is a sport that you know, it 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 it, it's, it's, it it rewards the best performers, right? Odell Beckham signed one of the biggest deals, right? Odell Beckham Jr. Um, well, another famous NFL player, only because I know him because he dances and he's got blonde hair, right? But he signed a really big contract recently, one of the biggest, I think, in NFL history. So it does reward you if you're really good at what you do. But if you get injured and you can't come back and you can't, um, you can't perform at the same level you were before, you are gone. It's fucking ruthless, right? So there's no loyalty in sports. Like, there's no loyalty. That whole warrior mentality doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't pay the bills, right? You only hurt yourself, right? Your family's one that has to suffer. Your wife has to suffer because she has to kind of, you know, wipe your ass uh, in the morning because you can't do it, right? Your, your children have to suffer because they, they have to feed you with a spoon because you can't feed yourself. Like, everyone else around has to suffer. Not the, not the NFL. They just keep on keeping on. They still keep running your highlights, your highlight reel on YouTube and, and collecting the ad revenue that doesn't go to you. Like, it's insane. So if, if this guy, Devontae Davis, right? Devontae Davis? Uh, Vontae Davis, sorry. If he decides at halftime that it's enough, I think that's cool. In the same vein that David Beckham woke up one day and thought, I don't want to go training. This is a good time to retire. That's great. I think Gary Neville has the same story too. He came on a sub uh, for May United one during one of his games in his late 30s or mid 30s and he got skinned a couple of times and he realized that was it. Like, I can't do this anymore. Like, he, he realized then and then that he was kind of running in custard. I think Kevin Carragher, same thing there. 
Like sometimes a sport just tells you when you should stop, but sometimes people are ignorant and don't listen to it. And then, you know, uh, fall down the professional ladder. Then your ego takes a boost. Imagine if you've been playing for Liverpool all your, all your life, playing Champions League games, Europa League games, getting called up for England. All of a sudden, because you're old and you're washed, you end up having to play for, I don't know, Sheffield United or some shit. Do you know what I mean? Like that must be excruciating for the ego. And you're still getting skinned in that league too because there's great... There's great, amazing players in that in that league too. So I don't, I don't, I don't begrudge the guy. I think he should be allowed to do it. If he retired and at that, you know, at that time at half time, and he thought that was the best time to do it, fair enough. There might be an argument to be said that maybe he should inform the players, but his teammates. But I don't think that was a good idea to tell your teammates during half time when they're down in the game that you're going to retire. That might not be the best way to go about things. You might probably make more enemies and friends in that regard. But I think in general, if he thinks that's the right thing to do, then say la vie, man. Let him do it let him do it anyway that was me rambling on for quite a long time actually it's like one hour 15 minutes so i think that might be a good place to end it i've got some other things i might pick up on uh tomorrow so thanks again for tuning into the agus nilzinga show episode number 108 it's been a real pleasure to speak to you once again um i'll be back i think tomorrow probably tomorrow because i'm djing late at night so i'll probably try and record something tomorrow especially if the brunette's out of the house i can record something if not i'll probably see you guys next week as always um i'll be djing this friday so when it comes out today i'm djing at tap east in westfield from 7 to 11 so if you're around come there i'm also djing at the white post cafe which is on um in hackney wick along the canal uh white post in hackney wick i'll be djing in there on saturday too from 10 till 1 that's going to be like a studio 54 disco theme party so if you're in the mood for some studio 54 vibes uh glitterable and cocaine then come down to that um i'll be supplying the glitterable um that'll be it uh, um for anything else relating to moi visit my website at www.zingagusnilzinga.com uh visit my sponsor at audible uh to claim one free book credit as well as a 30 day free trial at audible.com for slash aggie that's audible.com for slash a double g g y and obviously support me on patreon at patreon.com for slash agostino that's patreon dot com for just agostino all the money you send there will go towards better equipment i'm probably going to get a studio um in the next couple of weeks too i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go look around for studios and stuff and do some visits and see if i can rent one that is not as expensive as stuff i've seen because they're quite expensive to rent but i want to get just a studio so i can just go and just record shit and just leave my shit down record because at the moment having to do it at home is a bit clunky so that'll be good so if you can support me on patreon that'll be much appreciated and then youtube like and subscribe and all that um youtube malarkey i'm not gonna do what's up youtube but like and subscribe share tell your friends what i'm doing that malarkey that'll be much appreciated and again man and thanks again for tuning in. It's been Yaga Zinga Zinga Show episode number, or Zinga Zinga Zinga. That's not my name. My name is Yaga Zinga Zinga. been Yaga Zinga Zinga Show episode number 108. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll see you guys again on the other side. Peace!